cellular level, but also read out directly by next-gen sequencing. I uh, did RNA sequencing as well, and this is really where having multiple types of cancer, multiple mm -hmm. ways to read the cancer genome uh, is really very informative. In this case, SMAD4 had extraordinary data as well. And on the other end, RET was one, this is one of the most highest stresses of RET we'd ever seen. 34 times higher than the rest of the companion reference set. Uh, so very attractive druggable target. Nothing you'd even consider in this cancer type at the time without some sort of uh, genomic analysis. And P10, same sort of thing. It's deleted and expressed at a low level. So you have these two pieces of data that really um, sort of tie the story into a nice bow. Um, this list is helpful uh, because it's some feel of what genes are are active in the uh, are active in the cell. But at the time, it really makes sense of what the druggable targets were. They basically took all the um, the gene, basically all the uh, copy number data and the gene expression data, and assembled it into a pathway. And this to this day is still the way that the personalized oncogenome program is still thinking about and displaying these data, and that. They take a annotated canonical pathway and then they layer on the data for the patient. They layer on the copy number data, they layer on the expression data, and they sort of look at what pathways seem to have clusters of overexpression, deletion, amplification, et cetera. So in this case, there's RET oncogene was overexpressed, deletion of this negative regula regulator of that pathway. Um, this parallel pathway was relatively untouched, but really it looked at the time that they um, since RET was overexpressed, the downstream uh, targets on that pathway are also overexpressed. Uh, but really, this seemed to be the most important pathway in this gene. Not just because of the RET result, but of all the, the constellations of uh, genes and regulator, regulators, both activators and repressors, all seem to focus on the RET pathway. So they came up with a list. Here are the, taking all the genome data, could act on this axis. Uh, came up with a relatively short list, and then satinib, seracinib, and slindac. Uh, 
and this is really where you present this to the oncologist and say, what could this patient bear? Which of these drugs is actually available? What trials are ongoing? Um, and she chose, she chose, and it really worked. So after four weeks on sinitinib, one of the four drugs on the uh, on the chart, there's a 22% decrease in tumor size. So here's that original biopsy I showed you earlier, two nodes here. Uh, it took a month to do whole genome sequencing and all the analysis. So you can see during that month of analysis time, the tumors grew like this. Uh, started sinitinib right here, and then almost immediately within four weeks, you see the same tumor masses starting to shrink. So really this idea of knowledge of cancer genome variation, linking it to a drug, really the concept of the proof principle really appears to be quite promising. Uh, and he stabilized for uh, seven months. So they reduced the, clinically they reduced the, uh, side of the dose to reduce uh, side effects, otherwise great quality of life, sort of thing where he was thinking about coming back to work. Uh, but I started this entire talk talking about the inevitable resistance to targeted therapies, exact same story here. Then after seven months, um, or after four months rather, the lung mets began to grow. But we had all that genome sequencing data and we had three other drugs that could potentially be used. Uh, so I actually switched them to a combination of serafinib and Solindac, and again, stabilized the disease. So really hitting the same pathway in a different, uh, in a different way or hitting some of the other alterations in a different way uh, and continued for another, uh, another three months. Again, recurrent disease after seven months. So really this idea of hitting cancers on a single pathway in a single way with single agents did not work, certainly in his case. Uh, and in this case, actually recurrent disease, not necessarily in the lungs, but actually back in the primary site. So even though we had the tumor removed, that there were some residual tumor cells that were still growing or potentially metastatic cells from the lung going back and repopulating the primary. This is something that could be answered with genome analysis, not something that was done here. Uh, the other concern, a new nodule in the neck the lung mets are really starting to, um, to progress. There's new metastasis in the lungs. Quality of life is, of course, deteriorating. And the question here, genomically, is what has changed? Uh, so I went back in, I got another aspirate. Uh, so more cancer cells. So in this case, they have the neck mass. It's something that's very accessible um, with a uh, fine needle aspirate. The exact same analysis, and came up with all the mutations and alterations that they saw earlier, in addition to these additional mutations. Uh, none of these are really known cancer, <laughs> cancer genes. They're all missense mutations. They're very difficult to interpret. There's no functional data around what these mutations do. Uh, and this is really the challenge, especially with metastatic or recurrent disease. Uh, it's very hard to link even the function of these necessarily, no, most of them back to, uh, to as, as cancer drivers. No evidence whatsoever in the preterm biopsy, even at low frequency. If you're looking at the one read in uh, 50 or 60, there's no hint that these were there originally did the same idea. They took all the cop number alterations and mutations, mapped them back to the exact same pathway. And now you can, again, see this pathway is now like, it's just red hot. So there's cop number alterations, there's overexpression all over this pathway, as well as this parallel pathway as well. So in this case, the tumor's response to inhibit, inhibition of the, RAS, of the RAT pathway was just to ramp up RAT expression. So you have insanely high overexpression of this RAT pathway as well as a parallel pathway to achieve this, uh, the same biological goal. And this is really this idea of subclonal selection or these, this tumor dynamic that I alluded to right at the start really in action. You can see it in the real data, even just with a paired biopsy. And this is really where there are just more great um, treatment options then or even now, actually. Do you consider a cocktail of targeted drugs that have never been considered? That's completely not on the table. You can't just take drugs out of the medicine cabinet and give it to people. What do you do about these multiple pathways? Do you hit RET? Do you hit EGFR? Are there other pathways that are also active? Uh, completely untested, there's a real risk of adverse side effects. Uh, he was the only one at the time to have this level of genome analysis. We didn't really have nice reference sets like Genie has today. These are technologies that are really coming online. Uh, none of these mutations were evident pre-treatment, so this really speaks against the need, uh, against using small targeted panels to monitor these tumors, really the need to sequence even cell-free DNA fairly comprehensively to look for the acquisition of new drivers and mutations. Um, do you think about serial biopsies or blood tests? I mean, this is sort of the state of the art of uh, clinical genomics today. Uh, 
Uh, so here's his timeline. Unfortunately, in the end, he did enter palliative care uh, until he died. But you can really see the sort of the promise of clinical genomics to extend life and certainly quality, uh, quality and um, extensive life uh, with knowledge of cancer genome variation for time. Um, so I'll sort of leave it there, and we can take any final questions if there are any. Uh, so. が
sense there. Uh, I guess the other area is, is it being expressed at a norm at, at, at an unfortunately high level given the cancer of origin? Um, so uh, the expression data I find is also the most informative for trying to inform what's important in the mutation of medicine. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the five. It may change around the way what cancer was treated. Certainly in that new drivers arise, it's unusual to see a driver go away. Uh, it certainly does happen, especially if there's a large chromosomal deletion. Uh, but certainly acquisition of subsequent drivers, especially subsequent subclonal drivers, uh, I think that's going to be the main enemy as we get good at killing off clonal populations. Um, so the, I think once a driver, you're likely always a driver, but certainly additional drivers. Uh, we need the ability to find and monitor those over time. And then not just drivers, but also modifiers to existing drivers. So actually, I actually didn't mention this talk, but EGFR is the most famous. There are sort of three canonical activating mutations in EGFR, and they all get treated with the kinase inhibitor. But there's a very distinct secondary point mutation that increases the affinity of EGFR for ATP yeah. instead of the drug. Uh, so that secondary mutation is not really a driver, it's T7 IBM. Um, it's not really a driver, but it evades the drug itself. Um, so it's sort of hard to bin everything to passenger driver, even though I presented it a bit that way. Yes?
分どうでもいいや。